My daughter's story is loud, colorful, and artful. It's a game! She was awake, aware, and active. And yet she still died. After she gave birth, Shimani was complaining that she had really sharp chest pains. The ambulance came. I'm telling them the symptoms. Is she on drugs? Next set of people come in. Is she on drugs? They kept asking her mother, is she on any drugs? I'm like, do y'all talk? We waited a solid 12 hours. She's gone. Good afternoon and welcome to the Capehart Podcast on Washington Post Live. I am Jonathan Capehart, Associate Editor at the Washington Post. According to the CDC, Black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy from a pregnancy-related cause than white women. Various factors contribute to the Black maternity mortality crisis in the United States, from lack of access to quality health care to systemic racism. And the new and powerful documentary, Aftershock, dives into it all. Joining me now is the co-director of the film, Aftershock, and my longtime friend, Tanya Lewis Lee. Tanya, welcome to Capehart on Washington Post Live. Jonathan, thank you so much for having me. Well, th thank you again for, for being here. Let's jump right on in and talk about, uh, about the documentary, Aftershock. Uh, your New Yorker and the deaths of the two women whose stories you focus on um, were in your own backyard. What brought your attention to Shimani Gibson, uh, Amber Rose Isaac, and this larger epidemic? Well, first of all, I'd been hearing about Black women dying from childbirth complications for many years. I was a part of an infant mortality awareness raising campaign here in the United States, and the numbers are the same for Black babies that die before their first birthday, three to four times the rate of white women. Uh, and in 2019, uh, Shimani Gibson passed away uh, from um, a pulmonary embolism. And her mother, Shawnee Gibson, who is a reproductive rights advocate uh, activist, uh, put out a call to action when Sh Shimani passed away. She had a community service celebrating Shimani's life and wanted people to come and talk about um, you know, the issues that were related to, to her death. And so my co-director and co-producer Paula Izelt, uh, and I reached out to Shimani, I'm, I'm sorry, reached out to Shawnee, uh, and, uh, filmed them during this celebration. Also the men, Amari, who was, uh, Shimani's partner, had a group of men coming together talking about loss. Uh, when you lose a partner from childbirth complications. Um, and then several months later, in April of 2020, Amber Rose Isaac passed away, and Omari reached out to Bruce McIntyre, who was the partner of Amber, uh, and we just reached out to him to offer support and told him about the film that we were making and asked if Bruce wanted to participate. I will say that Amber, on her own, while she was going through her uh, pregnancy, posted on Twitter about uh, poor treatment that she was receiving. So she was already herself putting the word out about what was going on with her. Right, and I, I, um, I'm gonna ask all about that in, in a little bit, but since you brought up um, Shawnee Gibson, uh, Shimani's mother, let's play a, a clip from, um, a, a, if I remember correctly, it is of, of Shawnee, um, doing activism on behalf of her daughter and other women who have suffered accordingly. This momentum, it's like a wave. We keep showing up, we're not letting the pain stop us. We are holding people who have the most power accountable for how they use it. Our maternal health community is really pushing for change on Capitol Hill, trying to bring about different legislation in order to make sure that women have the care that, that they're supposed to. I can't let Amber be another statistic. I'm making people aware of what's going on in these systems. I planned on spending a lifetime with Amber. I wanted to give her my life. This way I'm still going to. Amber Rose Isaac, we hear you, we see you. Shamani Gibson, we hear you, we see you. Karen Johnson, we hear you. 
And so the, the two black men we saw, the first one was um, Omari, who you were talking about, and the second one um, we see is Bruce, um, who um, we hear his voice uh, at the end naming the names and saying, we see you, we hear you. Why did you, why did you choose to look at, the, at this topic through, through their eyes? It's the stories, the story of, of their partners passing away, but we're seeing um, the aftershock through their eyes, in addition to, to um, Shimani's mother. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the point is, is that the men are the ones that are left behind. I mean, Omari and Bruce are raising their children, um, you know, with Amber and Shimani gone. And I think that, you know, when we talk about maternal mortality and maternal morbidity, it feels like we're just talking about what happens to women. But yes, it happens to the women, but it happens to their families, it happens to their partners, it happens to their children, it happens to their mothers, it happens their, to their communities. So hence the aftershock uh, is for everyone who is left behind picking up the pieces. Uh, and I will say that Omari and Bruce in particular are, you know, they're amazing men in that they both became very activated. I mean, Bruce especially, Amber passed away in April 2020, as I mentioned, and he got right out there, I want to say within weeks of Amber's passing away, had a uh, press conference uh, and has been pounding the pavement ever since in terms of his activism, bringing, working to bring a birthing center to the Bronx, trying to come up with solutions so that other women and families don't have to go through what he's gone through. And Omari similarly, I mean, as I mentioned, Omari has, has become a man who really does reach out to other fathers who go through this situation and offer support. And they've created a community, a, a brotherhood that no one wants to be a member of. And yet they find um, support from each other and power in what they can do for their community. So it's a, it's a, um, as difficult as it is, it is a beautiful thing to watch how these men come together and really work for their families and for our communities. And, and you know, the, the other thing, I'm writing this down before, before I forget, a couple things. One, Omari, in addition, in, in his reaching out, he's an artist. And so yeah. he does portraits um, for the, sur the surviving men of their, the partners they lost. But the other thing that is so wonderful to see, and it's actually kind of enraging that this is a big deal, seeing the vulnerability of black men having lost um, the mother of their children and grieving in ways that quite honestly, society either doesn't show or doesn't want to see. Absolutely. I will say, I often say, I'm, I'm a very lucky woman in that I grew up with lots of beautiful Black men around me, my father, my uncles, uh, cousins. Um, and so I, I look at Amari and Bruce, and I, and, I, and I really, I love them, and they're beautiful men. Are they the exception? I don't know. I mean, because I've been lucky in seeing men who are able to be vulnerable. But I think it's really important, the point you're making, Jonathan, is that the representation has not been there. And we need to see more images of Black men as who care about their families, who care about their communities, who can be vulnerable and support one another. Um, and, it, and it's been amazing for me as a filmmaker to really watch uh, Omari and Bruce uh, find other men and support other men as they go through this horrific process of grieving. You know, I actually, I, I'm just going to go out there and say that Omari and, and Bruce are the rule. The exception is actually being able to see them and, and see them portrayed. So th I think there are two strands to, um, to your documentary, Aftershock. There's the, the racism involved, and we played it in the, in the intro clip, um, and it's in the movie where every time, a new, you know, the, the fire department, the EMTs and other people showed up at Shimani Gibson's and Omari's home, the first question is, was she on drugs? Was she on drugs? The assumption, because she's, because she's Black, that, that she's on drugs. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about the racism aspect of this before we turn to the medical, the big medical thing you bring up in Aftershock? Absolutely. And I, I appreciate you mentioning that about that issue 
be on drugs. Um, I think the other thing, Bruce talks a lot about how Amber, when Amber was pregnant, she wasn't feeling well. She was tired. She's a preschool teacher. Uh, she went to her doctor and said she thinks she needed to take family medical leave because she wasn't feeling well. And the doctor told her, well, what's wrong with you? Every, there are other people here who are pregnant. You, you, can, you can keep working. But Amber actually wasn't feeling well because her platelet drop levels were mm -hmm. dropping. Uh, and so, again, that's a little, that's a racist kind of trope, like, oh, you're lazy, you don't really want to work. Um, and so often, Black women, and as you showed that clip where Bruce is saying, Amber Rose Isaac, we see you, we hear you, is that when women are expressing pain or expressing something doesn't feel right, they're often sort of just pushed to the side and told, oh, you're, you'll be fine, either rest or keep going or doing whatever. Uh, and Black women just are not listened to when, when or believed when they talk about the pain and what they're going through. Right, and what's brought up um, in another portion of the documentary is how the experience of Serena Williams during her pregnancy and how she almost lost her life because the doctors and the nurses would not listen to her when she was telling them, telling them about her, initially, uh, about her pain. Let's talk about this really interesting medical aspect to all this. Um, you get into the business of childbirth. And, and Dr. Neil Shaw, is an, an OBGYN, said there's been, quote, an explosion in C-sections since the 1970s. And he explains that C-sections take less time and cost less for the hospital than a vaginal birth, but the hospital is paid more uh, for doing C-sections. And most important, Black women undergo the surgery the most. What's going on here and what role does race play in that trend? Yeah, I mean, first of all, C-sections, as you mentioned, have gone up. C-sections are major surgery. I think, unfortunately, because they've become so commonplace, people don't think of C-sections as being major surgery. And we see a correlation with maternal death going up as C-sections have gone up. In fact, it is more dangerous for my 27-year-old daughter to give birth today than it was when I birthed her. Uh, and so what we're seeing is that women really need support when they give birth. Um, you know, birthing is a natural process. It is not a pathology. Women are not sick. And too often what happens uh, is that doctors want to hurry up and push labor along. And so we're put on Pitocin very quickly to get that labor going. And if things don't progress the way we need them to progress, progress then you know, we're moved quickly into a C-section. And as Neil Shaw says in the film, you know, as a Black woman, if you don't have the support that you need, you get pushed into that C-section. And unfortunately, Black women are often do not have the support they need to be able to labor the way they should to have a healthy vaginal birth. So one of the, one of the most powerful lines I've heard in a long time, either in print or in movies or documentaries, comes from, from your film. And this is, comes after we're introduced to Felicia and Paul Ellis. This is the couple who live in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and she's weighing her birth birthing options in Tulsa, um, which Dr. Shaw points out has a national more, maternal mortality rate that is double the national average, um, just in general. So that means for Black women, it's even more. And Felicia poignantly says, this is the quote, a Black woman having a baby is like a black man at a traffic stop with the police. Why was it important to include their story in Aftershock? Well, first of all, we met Felicia um, when she, as she told us, she was thinking, and she says in the film, she was planning to have a birth at a hospital just like everybody else. And we did want to follow, while we were following the fathers who were left behind and Shawnee, uh, we did want to follow a pregnant woman and see what that process was like for her. Uh, but throughout, as she begins her process or as she's thinking about it, she says, well, maybe I should see what other options are out there for me. And she decides to look into a birthing center, into midwives, getting doula care, to find the support that she really needs for herself. Um, and, and Felicia really does uh, say a few things. I mean, she talks about Serena. I mean, she says, you know, mm -hmm. when she heard about Serena, 
it was like, she's the, you know, the most, she's the best athlete in the world. And if she has to fight for herself, what does that mean for the rest of us? Um, but what's so beautiful about Felicia's story, and I don't want to give things away, but she ends up finding the right birthing situation for her. And we get to see a birth that uh, has a wonderful outcome because of the support system that she has around her. And so it was really important for us to show what a truly supported birth looks like in our film. Right, and not to give too much, too much <laughs> away, but we, I'm going to give it away. Um, Go ahead. But it give is, it away. Give it, it away. It's beautiful. <laughs> we actually get to see Felicia Ellis go through the 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 process of having the baby to the point where we see the baby and just how natural and beautiful the experience the the experience at least as a viewer from my from my from my distance of of watching it just how it seemed like a beautiful experience for her to be able to give have the birth that she wanted. I think Felicia would agree with that. I think she would say she had the birth that she wanted, that it was beautiful. She felt really wonderfully supported by the women who were there with her, assisting her. Um, her husband was there assisting her. She felt very safe in that environment and very protected in that vi environment so that she could do the work of bringing her beautiful baby Lily uh, uh, Earthside for us. Uh, and so I, I just think that Felicia really is the example of what of what we all would want for ourselves and for our children. I, I mean, that's not to say it wasn't hard. I mean, you hear <laughs> you hear her going going through it, uh, but the end result the end result was beautiful. Another thing you do in in the film, Tanya, is um, you know not only talk about sort of the business um, behind birthing, but also the role Black women played unwillingly in fostering the what we now know as OBGYN care. Talk more about mm -hmm. that. Yes, yeah, so you're talking about the midwives. I mean, you know, uh, midwives have been around since the time of ancient. And uh, midwives came to this country uh, not only as enslaved people, there were midwives who attended uh, to indigenous people. I know midwives came with uh, the colonizers that came here. So, you know, when people settled here. So, you know, midwives have been around forever. And unfortunately here in the United States, as we moved into modern medicine and moved people into the hands of doctors and into hospitals, uh, there was a campaign that was launched against midwives to depict them as dirty and unsafe so that we would then go into the medical system. And it's really unfortunate because the United States is the only industrialized nation that does not have midwives integrated into women's care. And those other countries have better birthing outcomes than we do. So the data shows that when midwives are integrated into women's health, there are better outcomes. Um, and you know, it's my hope, and, and to this day, midwives, there are not that many midwives, there are not that many midwives of color. And it's my hope that with the film, we really can help with a conversation about how midwives uh, can be valuable to women and also to doctors and hospitals. I mean, you know, there are doctors out there like a Dr. Neil Shaw who really like working with midwives, you know? That's not to say we don't need obstetricians and gynecologists, but I think if everybody works together, uh, we can see that, that we could have better outcomes for sure. Yeah, in the film, you, you really go through the history of midwifery and then how men moved in took it over, white men in particular, really took it over, while at the same time using black bodies as exactly. tools for perfecting, for, for perfecting that portion of, of medical science. And you also, to your point about, you know, depicting midwives as, as dirty, there were also stories you show, newspaper stories, of how they were hunting midwives how they had basically criminalized mid midwifery to the point where I'm sitting there thinking here in 2022, given what happened with the repeal of Roe v. Wade and what the states are doing, that there's a, 
th there's a parallel thing happening here, no? Oh, I, I think absolutely, right? I mean, at the, at the end of the day, this is about controlling women's bodies, getting into women's business, understanding what's happening. Because, you know, as Helena Grant, uh, the midwife expert in our film says, uh, midwives were uh, the original abortion practitioners, right? I mean, it was controlling our reproductive health and men wanted to get in there and understand what was going on with women. And look, we can go back to enslaved women, you know, where abortion wasn't legal for us. We were raped, we were forced bred, and we could not get rid of those babies we didn't want. But but midwives did help us figure out ways. And so, you know, we're, we're still having the same conversation about men controlling what goes through a woman's body, which is I, I just, I can't believe we're still here having these conversations about men controlling women's bodies. Um, the fight continues, it never ends. Uh, it's a lot of power for a woman to be able to give birth. And um, I guess we'll just keep having this conversation uh, until it's done. And in fact, it was Hel Helena Grant who said the quote that I was, uh, I, I was thinking of when she says in the film, black women have been experimented on to perfect the profession of gynecology. That's what I, that's what I was thinking about. Um, We've got a um, an audience question um, that uh, from from Nancy Mance in, in California to pick up on the conversation about Roe v. Wade, where she asks, "How does this issue dovetail with the recent Supreme Court decisions and the state responsibility to Black women and healthcare?" You know, the thing about it is, is that unfortunately. Black women and brown women, I think, are going to bear the brunt of these decisions. I think we're going to be the ones, again, who uh, suffer the most uh, under these laws. Uh, and so, um, again, it's about control over our bodies. It's about making sure we get the best health care possible. Uh, and unfortunately, um, you know, this kind of decision just waters down maternal health care, women's health care in general. And um, I think it's a very frightening time. And I think what's going to happen is, you know, as you think about, you know, women who may need to have abortions for their for their own health, for their own well-being. Uh, uh, again, as I talked about earlier, people not believing Black women when they talk about their pain or what they're going through. Uh, how many bars are they going to have to um, uh, uh, go over to prove that they need the care that they need? And I think this is this is where we're really going to see some serious issues. Mm -hmm. You know, during during the film, we see Bruce and Amari evolve into into activists. Uh, Congresswoman Lauren Underwood introduces the the Black Maternal Momnibus Act uh, to improve maternal health among vulnerable populations. And I bring all that up to bring up a second uh, question that we got from the audience. This one from Washington D.C. from Monique Fraser, who's asking. How are you using the documentary to inform and shape public policy, both federal and state? Well, I think we're we're really using the film to raise awareness for everybody. You know, I think it's important, first of all, that everybody understand that there is an issue in this country uh, and that voting does matter. It does impact as we see. I mean, again, going back to the, the question about the Dobbs decision, you know, who is in office? determines who is in the, our court system, which determines our laws, right? So I think it's really important that we're all really aware of what the issues are out here that affect all of us, women, children, and families. And then we need to think about how we're voting uh, so that the laws really support our communities in a real way, not in a way that is uh, philosophical or theoretical. Um I gotta ask a, ask a follow up because if you read the papers and you hear some of the frustration, you know, you've got some folks, especially some young folks who say, but we voted. We voted you, meaning Democrats and President Biden in, and now look, Roe v. Wade has been overturned. Why should we, what, the solution is to vote again? To, yeah. to bring people in? Your, your reaction to that? 
Yes, the solution is to vote again, because you can't put this at the feet of Biden. This came from those who voted for Donald Trump. And I will say I get very upset. <laughs> I know I get very upset because I think about all of the women who voted for Donald Trump, not just the first time, but the second time, uh, so that he had the option to place those justices that he could in the Supreme Court that then went on and voted the way they did on Dobbs. So what I say to people is, yes, voting matters. You need to vote again and again and again, or you can run for office and, and change your world. But voting is everything. That's how we got here. And especially local uh, elections are important too. Those determine how we have birthing centers, what kind of laws affect midwives and doulas. All voting really matters. Get involved. <laughs> <laughs> I, I ask that selfishly because I'm actually I'm, I'm working on a, I'm working on a column on this very thing, uh, but that's a whole that's a whole other soapbox. We got a little bit of time left. I get you on two on two things. One, what's your end goal for um, for a film like Aftershock? I mean, you know, ultimately my end goal is better birthing outcomes for black women and ultimately all women, right? Because I often say, even if you don't care about the state of black women, if you pay attention what's happening to those that are most vulnerable, you know that it will ultimately come for you. And really white women are not doing as well as their counterparts in European nations either. Uh, and so my hope is that with the film, we raise awareness, uh, that people understand that there are other birthing choices out there for them, that women seek the options that are best for them so they have the best supported births, and that our communities, our societies, our politicians, our legislatures work to help support birthing people. And, and finally, because we're introduced to them, we follow their stories, what are Amari and Bruce up to now? Yeah, I mean, Amari and Bruce are, again, as I said, they're just amazing. Amari continues to paint. Uh, he's having shows um, and, and just developing an amazing body of work, working with lots of fathers, unfortunately. Uh, every, every day, somebody else, um, unfortunately, passes away from childbirth complications. So he it remains in touch with them and, and supporting the community. Bruce has been really working uh, legislatively. Uh, that he worked on passing a law so that uh, New York State can now have midwife facing birthing centers. He's working to bring that birthing center to the Bronx. But in the meantime, he has worked with, uh, there's a doula, Myla Flores, who is in the film, as well as a woman named Nubia Martin, who's in the film. Together they've worked and created what they've called Womb Bus which is a bus that drives around and provides um, um, uh, healthcare services for women in the community. So Bruce remains very active. In fact, I think he's going to the White House next week uh, talking about the issues. He's probably bringing Amari with him. Uh, they remain very active and I, I think we're gonna see a lot of them in the years to come. Right, in, in my notes here, it says Bruce founded the Save a Rose Foundation and Omari is the founder and president of the Advancement of Reproductive Innovation through Artistry and, and Health Foundation. So th those two men are, are busy. In addition to doing all those things, they're taking care of, of the children who lost their moms. Beautiful children. Um, Anari and Kari are, are Amari's children. Elias is Bruce's son. They are beautiful young children and they're doing a remarkable job uh, while they do everything that they do. And I appreciate you mentioning Save a Rose Foundation and Aria Foundation and anyone who wants to support their work can go to aftershockdocumentary.com and find their uh, um, organizations and support them and follow them. The key line from the Aftershock documentary, um, which crystallizes this, this issue, is a black woman having a baby is like a black man at a traffic stop with the police. And that came from Felicia Ellis, um, who was pregnant in the movie and she gives birth in the movie in, in a very beautiful moment. Tanya Lewis Lee, co-director and co-producer of Aftershock, which premieres on Hulu on July 19th. Thank you so much for coming to Capehart on Washington Post Live. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for having me. 
And as always, thank you for joining us to check out what interv interviews we have coming up. Head to WashingtonPostLive.com. Once again, I'm Jonathan Capehart, Associate Editor at The Washington Post. Thanks for watching Capehart on Washington Post Live.